Hey, we're back. We're live with Global Connections here on a given Wednesday. And we have our old friend, Carlos Suarez, a professor of international relations. In fact, the chair of the international relations department at uh, university, University Dodd. To, uh, mm, mm, university Dodd. What's the name of your school, Carlos? <laughs> university of the Americas in English is good enough. Okay, that's good enough, good enough. And in fact, you know, when I think about it, uh, Global Connections is, is Carlos's original creation. <clears throat> we invented that term, or he invented that term, how many years ago, Carlos? It's great Some to have you ago. on the show. <laughs> great, and thank you, Jay. I'm delighted to, to join you as always, a great conversation. And, you know, we live in interesting times that we have to stop and reflect about it, try to analyze, and that's what these shows allow us to do, to dig a little beyond the headlines, right? And, yes, absolutely. Ask. Connecting the dots around the world, uh, especially mm -hmm. from Mexico City, uh, and um, the, the subject we talked about, we are going to talk about today, is uh, American foreign policy, a Trump doctrine, if you can find one. <laughs> so what, yes. wh why do you say Trump doctrine at all, Carlos? And, and, yeah. and, and how, how confused and incoherent is any such doctrine? Well, very confusing, very incoherent. And well, really, the reason we ask is because when we study, and I'm a professor here of international relations, uh, remind our audience I'm in Puebla, just to the east of Mexico City, Puebla. Yes, thank uh, you. Uh, uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, as we look back at, let's say, post-World War II, we, we've had a several presidencies, U.S. presidencies, that have often been characterized as having a doctrine, uh, really like a, a clear strategic focus, a purpose, something that you can describe. Uh, uh, Truman had a doctrine uh, after World War II that was aimed at containing communism, uh, obviously the growing threat there. Reagan, uh, fast forward a few terms there, uh, he came to have a version of, of a doctrine that sort of was rolling back communism, a little bit more interventionist, uh, you know, Bush doctrine, preemptive strike, sort of go it alone, uni unilateralism. You know, right now there's been some ongoing dialogue among sort of the, the foreign policy community. Is there a Trump doctrine? Or even more generally, two and a half years now into this presidency, how do we explain it or understand it or make sense of it? The short answer, it's not easy. And, and in fact, when we look at Trump himself, understanding his foreign policy is a challenge. Uh, he, uh, After all, he's never written or spoken much about uh, the subject most of his life. He was a private, uh, you know, businessman, a TV show uh, personality. Uh, but of course, foreign policy is not only made by individuals, it's made by a team, advisors, other key people. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. The key person is John Bolton, of course, uh, the national security advisor. Uh, but more to the point, you know, some have tried to say, well, if there is a Trump offer, is it this, you know, make America great? Or is it this, you know, America first? Or maybe critics will call it America alone. Uh, when we look around the world, you know, where, what what we can do is take a snapshot of what have been the policies, the approaches. And let me ask uh, if we can pull up our first uh, graphic. We have a picture here of the Trump foreign policy that just quickly illustrates, you know, his actions. Now, short version is, again, he came to office and the first actions were to pull out, pull out of the Paris Climate Accord, pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, a pretty aggressive, uh, you know, rather unilateral approach as well. Uh, but many, uh, we, you know, we can't talk about all of these, but in general, a very assertive foreign policy, and one in some ways driven by a lot of domestic uh, uh, interests, a desire to satisfy, uh, uh, you know, some of his uh, supporters, if you will, uh, building a, a wall uh, to you know, limit immigration, etc. Uh, the, the Muslim ban, very controversial. But in the end, uh, let, let's be very clear, um, you know, on one hand, he represents a sort of nationalism, uh, maybe a, a nationalist conservatism, uh, you know, kind of pull back. And we have to appreciate that in the big scheme of American foreign policy, isolationism, even elements of nationalism have always been there. There have been strong tendencies of, between internationalism and isolationism. Today, we could say we're in a period of relative, somewhat more relative retrenchment. That is isolationism on one hand, maybe not by design, but by reality, because of the approach of Trump. He has alienated and taken on a lot of traditional allies. Uh, you spoke earlier about having talks with the what the Belgian consul there uh, about European affairs, and um, the short answer: well, he will eventually pass, and you know the Europeans kind of looking the long term. The reality is he's there now, and he is making some tough choices that are going to be with us even long before he's gone. Uh, and and maybe uh, what many international observers are saying: the U.S. has lost a lot of credibility, uh, leadership role that will not be easy to replace. Whoever succeeds Trump, uh, whether. 2020 or four years later, uh, the damage of U.S. 
image and credibility abroad is significant and, and you know, hard to measure, but it is real. Uh, but back to this question of a, what is the, the thing we might call a, uh, a worldview? Uh, again, he has just broken all the norms uh, uh, in, in every way. Uh, we have this new concept now. We talk about Twitter diplomacy. That didn't exist before Trump. But now you have to read what he's saying. In the morning, he might say something rather dramatic, outlandish. By the afternoon, he's spinning a different story. Um, but certainly now we have to be watching, you know, and observing and reading what his Twitter feed says to make sense of, of his view. Um, but back to maybe, uh, let, let me have, bring up the next picture. Uh, we have a, an example of, you know, Trump, he, he's not comfortable in multilateral settings. He's not comfortable going off to these meetings. Uh, last year, this picture came out after a summit meeting of the G7. Uh, I think it was in Munich, uh, Germany, perhaps. Uh, and you could just see the body language. There he is sitting like an angry young boy being scolded at by, you know, the, the doyen, the dean, uh, Angela Merkel of Germany. Uh, he's got his deputy right next to him, uh, John Bolton, the national security advisor, you know, um, holding his briefing papers. But Trump, uh, what does the body language tell us? You know, it's obviously, you know, he's, he's, he's frustrated, angry, not being cooperative. Um, but then let's take for a moment his... TV personality background. I mean, uh, as critical as we may be of him and his foreign policy and his personal agenda, there is no question that he is a genius at marketing and sort of the image and, and you know, sort of that kind of aspect of it. Uh, if we can turn to the next picture, I have a, a picture of him last uh, year, the first of two summit meetings with the North Korean leader. Uh, we've often seen reference to how he seems to like a lot of these uh, dictators, uh, whether it's Little Kim in North Korea or Duterte in the Philippines or Turkey, Zerdogan. Um, he's something about authoritarian leaders that he seems to really enjoy the, the limelight. And with Kim, you know, a lot of fanfare, a lot of fluff, a lot of image, not a lot of substance. Uh, you know, one meeting that, okay, they met. The second meeting, uh, the more recent one in Vietnam, they both went home, or actually the U.S. pulled out and broke off the, the negotiations. And where are we now? Uh, good luck uh, making sense of that. Um, finally, uh, one last picture I want to turn to very quickly, which is the case of Russia, because we have a puzzle of, you know, the uh, government, uh, I'm sorry, Trump's uh, bromance, his, his affinity for Russia. Here's a strange bulletin board uh, that shows the two together, and it's got Russian writing on the top and on the bottom. It tells us, let's make the world a great again together. Obviously, this is a tongue-in-cheek tongue joke, but, you know, you saw the, the body language as well at the Hel Helsinki summit where he met with Putin, came out and literally you know, made a, an astonishing statement that he did not believe his intelligence community's assessments about the Russia interference in the U.S. elections. And he had every reason to believe Putin's uh, and didn't provide any, uh, uh, well, uh, and that he didn't allow, you know, even his uh, uh, translators or anybody in the discussion. So it just leaves us with this uncertain, you know, strategy approach. Does he have a doctrine? Again, no, not really, unless you call chaos uncertainty and uh, unpredictability a doctrine. Not quite. Uh, is well, it America let's, first? Let's assume, that, no. let's assume there is chaos here because there's no uh, consistency, not, not from minute to minute or day to day. And uh, these things don't get written down. They just get twittered out or uh, mm -hmm. impromptu um, Rose Garden kind of statements without press press conferences or questions from reporters. We haven't had a press conference since March 11th. It's a long time already. Um, that, gee, that's two months. Um, and, um, you know, let's, let's assume it's a chaos policy. The question I, I would ask you, Carlos, is uh, where does a chaos policy get? Can you have, you know, you, you, you teach international relations. You're in a school mm -hmm. of international relations. Can you have, can this country afford to have a chaos policy? Well, not without costs. No, not without costs, because clearly it leaves just a, a, a continued uncertainty and, and unpredictability. And if you could imagine you're trying to, I don't know, prepare for a negotiation, for a meeting, uh, what do you do? How do you prepare? I mean, what are the talking points? Uh, we, we've heard again and again on Trump when he goes on these meetings, he just wings it. He's sort of just, he's got this gut feeling and he's going to look him in the eye. Well, too much of what happens in the world is very complex and requires somebody to know the background, the details, uh, the context. Um, you know, even just uh, the foreign policy community, uh, we, again, understanding that U.S. foreign policy is not made by an individual, but it's a pretty large bureaucracy, many interests, private interests as well. Um, you know, it, it, it's just remarkable how 
uh, today we we don't have any clear picture. Uh, you know, the the diplomatic community has been you know severely curtailed. I'm sitting here in Mexico today, and and I can tell you, two and a half years into the presidency, we do not have a U.S. ambassador in Mexico. Uh, oh wow! Um, okay. And this uh, this is true of a number of other countries too. Uh, major players. Uh, there's no ambassador to the United Nations after you know the last one had resigned. Uh, we have an acting defense secretary in the U.S. Uh, there's no secretary of Homeland Security since uh, uh, the departure most recently of of, of, uh, uh, of the of the secretary. So there are a lot of missing pieces and puzzles, and and you know that's not how uh, a large power should run. No, well, it, it accentuates uh, the chaos, doesn't it? I mean, for example, mm -hmm. if you if you don't appoint anybody as the actual. United Nations uh, representative, then you don't have to go to Congress to get confirmation of anybody. And so uh, if you don't have anybody, you become the representative. If you have somebody mm -hmm. who's acting, um, you have total control of that person. There's no confirmation. Bottom line is this is a uh, sole proprietorship government. <clears throat> Bottom line no, is that no, he is no, calling no. the shots on. He is speaking for every department, every office, in every in every context. <clears throat> and this and this means that if it's chaos, the chaos is complete. Am I right? Yeah, that's correct. Absolutely. And uh, and and you know, I think it underscores something I've long believed, and more and more we're coming to accept that the, the, Trump never came to office expecting to win, and certainly wasn't prepared to govern. Didn't have teams in place, and doesn't even. You know, understand the basic, you know, I guess process of governance. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and when we're dealing with foreign affairs, foreign policy, it gets more complex, more messy. Diplomacy is a lot about image and and signals and and you know building confidence and trust. And when you throw all that out and just have chaos, it just it, you know your head spins. You just don't know how to make sense of it. Um, you know, uh, you know, for many people, so I go back to read his book, uh, The Art of the Deal, to learn how to you know how to how he seize the world or make sure if you meet him that, you know, everything is presented in very brief, simplistic, uh, you know, uh, visuals and, and that his name is prominent in a big, bold letters. Um, that's not how you should run a, a foreign, you know, policy uh, or, 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 you know, bilateral meetings with anybody, multilateral. So it's, it's a mess. Uh, but going back to, you know, how do we make sense of him? You know, you know it's hard because he doesn't represent sort of the classic realist perspective, although he has elements of realism, uh, one of the approaches very, very common in, in understanding world politics. Uh, the world is a dark and pessimistic place. He certainly doesn't harbor a lot of liberal uh, international elements. If anything, he disdains everything, anything that has to do with multilateral, almost anything that was done before him, he's got to reverse just in principle, not without carefully thinking it out. Um, and, uh, you know, we've just got a world of, of tremendous... Uh, chaos. Uh, now, having said all that, uh, I want to just say uh, it's interesting that we can turn to who are his key advisors and players, because in the understanding of foreign policy, that's what it takes. We, you know, who are the people you know, either talking to him, who are the people briefing him? Uh, I have one last picture I'll show, and it's uh, the number fifth one, where we have a picture of his core advisor, John Bolton, and he came into office this past year, is the newly appointed national security advisor, a very crucial role, the person who literally is just a stone's throw down the hall in the West Wing, who briefs him, who prepares him. And, you know, if we look carefully at this man, uh, John Bolton, he he does have a worldview. Uh, as best we can tell, it's a pretty bleak and harsh one, perhaps closest to, uh, you know, the classic Thomas Hobbes view of the world, nasty, brutish, and uh, uh, and short. Uh, uh, but it is a, a dark view, uh, maybe paralleling some of what we saw under George W. Bush, uh, Dick Cheney's worldview, very pessimistic. Uh, and, you know, in the case of uh, of Bolton, uh, he's got a long record of things he said, particularly before he came back into government and as a Fox News commentator. Um, but it's one thing to be a commentator and talk hard and talk tough about the world. It's another thing to be sitting at the table across from Kim Jong-un or other leaders and having to somehow articulate a foreign policy. Uh, yeah, and he's a hawk. He's a hawk. He's a, yeah. His statements suggest that he's looking for war. It's very troublesome yep, yep. in our time. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, and, and we see right now some hot pot spots that are getting more tense. Uh, the situation in Iran is rapidly moving uh, to create more tension. And he suddenly showed up in neighboring Iraq and, and he's been rattling that saber quite a bit. Um, and so it is a view that's very aggressive. It's very unilateral. It's very militant. Uh, and all of those are worrisome because, uh, you know, uh, if you govern by that view and, and you take impulsive actions without a lot of, you know, understanding the implications, 
uh, you run into some problems, I guess. Uh, you know, Dick Cheney had this worldview of uh, somehow spreading democracy in Iraq, and and, and look what happened there. It has look what happened there. Yeah. Uh, Carlos, uh, so, we're going to take a, a short yeah. break, if you don't mind. I come back, and mm -hmm. I would like to discuss with you after we come back uh, what the risks are in each one of these different theaters. They, they, sure, they're absolutely. different, but they're somehow similar also. Carlos Juarez uh, from the University of the Americas in Puebla, Mexico. Uh, we'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Aloha, this is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. All right, we're back. We're live with Global Connections here on a given Wednesday and Carlos Suarez in uh, Pueblos, Mexico. Carlos, you know, you, you know, you've talked about a number of, um, what do you want to call it, points of tension. And my little list is we have points of tension with China, <clears throat> even this week with Iran, with North Korea. I, I consider what's going on in Venezuela certainly a point of tension. You could say that, you know, the whole, the whole border issue on the southern American border is a point of tension. Um, and, and, I, and Africa, where Trump is building a huge drone facility for who knows what. Uh, so uh, lots of points of attention, points of attention. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, um, you know, what are the relative risks of these? Uh, we have, you know, what, two years to go, a year, you know, two years to go, a year and a half to go. Um, mm -hmm. And I worry about getting through his, uh, his term. Hopefully it's a limited term, one term, um, without, without uh, some kind of um, international conflagration. What do you think? Yeah. Boy, I mean, if you do look at those many, many hot spots, it, it, it's a daunting, uh, you know, rather stark possibility that any of them could turn into a, a massive, uh, just mess. Uh, uh, and of course, we have this um, long history in the U.S. of uh, criticism that uh, often faced with a lot of uh, problems back home, uh, leaders might be incentivized to wag the dog you know, as a sort of, you know, create a little uh, external uh, crisis to divert attention. Let's hope that doesn't play out. But um, if you can imagine, I mean, all the pressure coming on the president now following this Mueller report, the intransigence, the uh, now, you know, what they're calling executive uh, decree or no, what do they call it? Executive orders to not comply. All the pressure, in other words, happening here at home. And then you wake up every morning and here's a president that we're told probably doesn't read or get his intelligence briefing in great detail. So he doesn't really know all the details. Somebody does. Hopefully Bolton is at least reading it, but that's scary in and of itself. Yes. But any of these any of these issues could flare up in a, in a way that can produce some very, very troubling situation. Uh, beginning uh, just with the ongoing crisis here with Mexico, Central America. I mean, that has not played out its full you know, story yet. It remains still a tug of war. The wall, I mean, what we have that hasn't been in the headlines this week or last, but you know, that, that he's obsessed with this uh, idea of just sealing the border. 
Uh, the problem with that, migration and, and these kind of issues, they don't get solved easily. They, they require a concerted effort, uh, many multi-levels, you know, uh, obviously working closely with Mexico, Mexico with its neighbors to the south. Uh, it's, it's, th th this could find itself with some incident flaring up and becoming even nastier. But I would turn as well to Venezuela. Here's a case where we have seen, and, and even uh, Bolton, the National Security Advisor, has been very aggressive in saying, this is our background. The Monroe Doctrine is alive and well, and, and that he has even articulated a view that he might invoke the so-called Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. For the, you know, listeners, the Monroe Doctrine dates back to James Monroe in the you know, 1830s, 40s, when the U.S. basically carved out Latin America, the Americas, as our sphere of influence. Uh, Europeans, you know, not allowed. Um, and the Roosevelt that, that was Corollary, a wise move, don't you think? Well, Monroe, Monroe uh, made it specific that existing European colonies here in the Americas would be left alone. That was okay. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't diminishing them in any way, but he said new ones wouldn't be tolerated. And you know that the remarkable thing about the Monroe Doctrine is until now, it has stuck. Until now, mm -hmm. you know, there have been no additional European colonies. And as far as I know, you know, uh, uh, South America has remained consistent with the Monroe Doctrine now 200 years after the fact. Uh, that's, yeah, quite, yeah. that's quite impressive. But uh, I would suggest to you, Carlos, now with Venezuela, it's coming apart because the Russians and the Chinese are in there and Trump can't stop them, isn't stopping them. Yeah? And but the, the challenge there is that if, if by reasserting this and reaffirming that this is the U.S.'s territory, it, it also makes the case that, well, that means Russia can do what it wishes in its region of the world. And, and frankly, Iran, why doesn't it have a powerful vested interest in the Middle East in a way that you know we don't belong there? Uh, so it gets harder to sustain an argument that this is ours and stay away, uh, in the, particularly in this globally interdependent world. The Chinese and, uh, and, and the Russians have, uh, on one hand, economic reasons to want to support Venezuela because they're owed a lot of money, but there's the geopolitical angle too. They don't want to see the U.S. come out winning or, uh, I would add to that as certainly as I'm here in Latin America and Mexico, Latin Americans, uh, they, you know, they don't see the Monroe Doctrine or the Roosevelt Corollary as very positive things. It's basically helped justify a long history of intervention. And so while Americans may wrestle with, gosh, you know, Venezuela, will we intervene or what? For Latin Americans, it's like more, here we go again, and there's no surprise. And uh, and even today, as the, as the opposition leader Guaido, you know, he had a, an effort, what, a week or a little 10 days ago to try to bring about a change. Many believe very much that the U.S. is behind the scenes doing everything it can and, and that he only could have done that if he had some signal from the U.S. that we'll back you, we'll be there to help you. So there's a lot of that maneuvering going on. But Having said that, let me turn to a couple of other of the regions where we just, again, we see continued uncertainty and chaos. Uh, the challenge with Europe um, having already, you know, sort of <clears throat> signaled uh, the U.S.'s uh, on and off again support for NATO alliance, uh, its criticism of the, you know, European Union in general. Uh, it's, you know, the Brexit uh, drama that, while it's off the back burner today, it's going to continue to come back to us. Uh, the U.S. has, again, I think, alienated and frustrated a lot of the Europeans. Uh, to the point where they realize that, um, you know, he too shall pass. Let's just hope it's sooner than later and that he doesn't wreck the world before that happens. But uh, just as Latin Americans shake their head about this man, I'm constantly asked, you know, how how do people, how, do, how does he have such a large support of people that will vote for him no matter what? And again, the answer is complex itself. A lot of it has to do with this divide uh, in the globalization era between the winners and losers. And there are many, understandably, who have lost out and, and who feel... Uh, a disconnect between the elites and, and, and the establishment and whatnot. Uh, but again, back with Europe, uh, I think sadly we, we have a world in which the U.S., which helped to establish the world order after World War II, which helped work closely with those European allies, is today a country I think increasingly seen as less dependable and reliable. Uh, will that you know be overcome? I mean, uh, there are some who will, uh, the older generations maybe who understand the longer history, uh, but younger populations who don't read books in history and don't know that uh, may not be able to appreciate the, you know, the, the, the importance of the role of the U.S. in rebuilding war Europe and the alliance systems that, that we've had in place for so long. Um, you point, you point the, out a, a, a tremendous uh, risk and a, and a trend that's very unsettling. But, um, you know, at, at somewhere in there, Carlos, is the, the world economy. 
And, um, mm -hmm. you know, the stock market in the U.S. and other places went down 500 points yesterday. I don't know what it's like today, but it, it raises the risk that whatever Trump's machinations or lack of uh, policy are, domestically and internationally, uh, one of these days, uh, the economy that he boasts about is going to disappear. And that's going to have an effect. You know, still, the U.S. Is, uh, is an important factor in the world economy. That's going to have an effect uh, on the world economy. And if the world economy changes, this non-doctrine, this non-doctrine, non-policy policy that he has will have even greater effect. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, would, would, a, would a world economic decline uh, have an accelerating effect on the problems you're talking about? Well, yes, and 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 I suppose uh, you know, as always happens in economic downturns, somebody's got to be blamed for it. Now he would blame the Democrats and Obama and whoever else, but um, I also think that uh, a downturn would probably begin to erode some of his, uh, you know, maybe the the more limited, weaker support. The hardliners, uh, the base support may not change. But I, I think the trouble here is that in past, uh, maybe you look at 10, 11 years ago, we had a big financial crisis in the global economy. The United States, in many ways, stepped up uh, in that leadership role and then helped to address uh, the crisis. I don't see that happening right now. I don't mm. see, you know, uh, Mnuchin, the Secretary of the Treasury, somehow, you know, carrying on a, a bold, you know, initiative to save the world economy. Uh, you know, I guess I, I would be surprised. Uh, uh, to, to that. And and I just, you know, we've seen again and again that Trump doesn't really have a good understanding of basic economics, let alone complex international economics. Uh, so last question, last question. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, is this, I mean, you know, you you have a good perspective. You can look at this from, you know, um, from Mexico and uh, uh, you can you can see it maybe more clearly in, than many people. Uh, and I wonder what your advice would be uh, to Donald Trump going forward for the rest of his, at least this term of his presidency, about organizing the experts that can really help him, about formulating some kind of doctrine, some kind of policy that would be consistent and would avoid these hot spots and risks we've been talking about. What was your, what is your advice to him, Carlos? Ouch. I was hoping you wouldn't ask that. Um, <laughs> Well, Sorry. look, uh, uh, you know, given given what we know of him so far, I don't think he's likely to change or overnight become suddenly somebody willing to look at the full range of options. Perhaps, uh, you know, to put yourself in his mindset, he's got to see something that makes him come out winning, makes the U.S. come out winning. So it's got to be finding that convergence. What can he do that's going to save the U.S. that he can take credit for, but will also, uh, you know, help address uh, whatever might be falling apart in the global economy. But boy, uh, you know, try, try to give him a lesson that, hey, we need allies, we need, you know, we need global uh, cooperation for certain things. Uh, it's a tough, tough challenge. I'm glad I don't have to do that. I wish somebody could. I don't see that in the cards. Uh, I, I think uh, we're stuck with this rather impulsive and, and uh, disjointed and, and impetuous uh, leader who who is driven by just the here and immediate now and the image and, and uh, uh, it's it's not a pretty picture. Now, we have muddled our way through two and a half years, maybe looking at it that way, another 18 months ain't that much more, but uh, anything could happen. And we we've just touched on the fact that we have a lot of hot spots that could, any one of those could flare up. Um, and, uh, and, and just as you mentioned yesterday, stock market, I mean, uh, the international financial system often can be very, very, immediate and, and profound and how it shocks uh and if we don't have a concerted effort the europe uh, the us and other major players working together uh it could only get worse and so i i'm a bit pessimistic about how trump can be the leader of that uh i i just hope he doesn't damage it more that it's going to require more to be fixed once he is gone but like you said i think with your earlier guest the belgian uh, ambassador or, i'm sorry consul there uh, like many Europeans, I mean, let's just hope we can write them out and uh, and then, you know, see a reverse, uh, uh, maybe not even reverse, but a correction that, that's badly needed. Uh, the U.S. Yeah. Uh, needs uh, needs to be a global leader, even if it's a modest one, but uh, yeah. we don't see that today. One, one, thing, one thing is clear, you know, that comes out of all of this, and, and that's this. Um, you know, we have a reality show going on in Washington every day. Uh, with all of these uh, reality show type issues get you all excited 
Um, but we, we, all of us, uh, and especially the electorate, we have to look and see what he's doing on the international front. We have to see how, the, how these mm, hotspots that he creates and has created and will create uh, will affect our future, our leadership in the world and, our, and our, the defense of our nation from outside. And so um, it's not a matter of focusing on, on all these hearings in Congress uh, to the exclusion of looking at international things. I think we have to watch that, too. And we have to factor that into any voting we do about um, the Republicans and about, about Trump. Carlos, we're out of time. I yes. uh, really enjoy these discussions. Uh, let's look forward to doing it again uh, two weeks hence. Thank you so much, Thank Carlos so much. Juarez. Aloha. Aloha.